Okay, good afternoon again. This will be the last talk of today, and uh, we will hear Carolina Sartorio. She is professor of philosophy at the University of Arizona, and the title of her talk is A Good Cause. Uh, thank you very much, Carolina. The, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for having me. So everybody can hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate um, in this conference in honor of Steve. Steve was my advisor in graduate school, and uh, he was always brilliant and kind and uh, supportive and a source of inspiration for me, and also over the years. Um, so I'm very grateful to Steve, and I'm, again, very happy to be here. Sorry that I have to miss uh, most of the conference because of the time difference. It's 9 a.m. here in Arizona right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I think is an underappreciated virtue in Steve's account of causation. Uh, the view, I think, captures a concept of cause that is particularly well suited for grounding the moral responsibility of agents. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think that is the case by focusing on two main features of Steve's account. And then um, I'm going to identify what I see as some potential problems that remain. I'm going to make um, some sort of diagnos diagnosis towards the end. And I'll um, provide um, what I think is a solution or a sketch of a solution at least for those problems, or how um, I think they could be handled, at least in principle. So the two main features of Steve's account that I want to focus on are, very briefly, one, the proportionality or commensuration criterion, according to which roughly causes have the right amount of specificity for their effects, the right amount of detail for their effects. So I'm going to talk about a little bit um, um, on each of these uh, features um, um, in, in a while. But the main, um, the, the, the first feature is supposed to hold or apply to cases that um, are not cases of overdetermination. So the, the second feature will have something to say about cases of overdetermination. So for the first feature, we don't have to worry about that. So the second feature is the uh, de facto dependence account of causation. And one way to see that account is as claiming that causes have the right kind of difference-making powers, basically. And in particular, one thing that is particularly relevant for moral responsibility and the way that causation can ground moral responsibility is that um, Steve's account can help us distinguish between two types of cases of that kind, overdetermination cases. Uh, cases where a certain event seems to be a cause of the effect and cases where it doesn't seem to be a cause of the effect. So this is the difference between preemptors and switches so these are, again, cases where simple counterfactual dependence fails because they are overdetermination cases. But still, Steve's account allows us to distinguish between them by appeal to this more sophisticated concept of de facto dependence. OK, so I hope that when I scroll down, you see me scrolling down the handout. OK, good. Um, so. Um, how is this going to be relevant for moral responsibility? Well, because causation is taken to be grounds for moral responsibility, and in particular for moral responsibility for outcomes. Um, and the standard view of understanding that relation between causation and responsibility is that, uh, or is captured by the claim that an agent's moral responsibility for an outcome requires and is partly grounded in the agents having caused the outcome, where this is just a partial grounds claim. So of course, there are other conditions that need to be met for the agent to be more responsible for the outcome. 
And in particular, it's common to distinguish an epistemic condition according to which the agent um, had the relevant kind of awareness or the agent could foresee that the outcome would come about or was likely to come about as a result of uh, their behavior. So we're not going to worry about the epistemic condition um, in this talk, but it's important to bear in mind that other conditions also have to be met for the agent to be morally responsible. But the causal condition is a really central condition. And when those other conditions, epistemic conditions are met, um, we tend to think that the agent should be held morally responsible for that outcome. So notice that this is a form of derivative responsibility, not basic responsibility, meaning that the agent's responsibility for the outcome is derived from the agent's responsibility for other things, other more basic things. So um, we think in those cases that the agent is responsible for that outcome, call it O, by virtue of more basically being responsible for some antecedent behavior that caused that outcome. So that's where we see the causal condition at play. And again, this is uh, just uh, one of the epistemic, sorry, one of the conditions that have to be met in addition to the epistemic conditions. Okay, so how does um, Steve's account help support this role that causation plays in grounding moral responsibility. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna look at, uh, um, at each feature that I mentioned before, the proportionality or commensuration criterion, and then the de facto dependence um, suggestion. And uh, in each case, I'm going to be identifying some potential problems that I see so we're going to start with feature one, the proportionality or commensuration criterion. Again, the basic idea is that causes have the right amount of specificity or detail for their effects. Here you have a couple of examples to illustrate the, the main idea. So imagine that Susie says hello loudly to Billy and that caused him to be upset. But this is a case where it's really her having said it loudly, not her, her having said hello, that um, is causally relevant. Um, so having said hello is actually a nice gesture. It's just the particular way in which she said it, and more specifically, the fact that she said it loudly. Also, it's not as specific as her having said hello while chewing gum, let's assume, so Billy wasn't offended by the fact that she was chewing gum while saying hello, while saying hello loudly. And then another example is imagine that Susie throws a rock at a window and that causes the window to break. Uh, so this is an ordinary case where somebody throws a rock at a window and the window breaks as a result. We want to say, for example, that it's not her throwing any object at the window, but a rock, right? So it's not her throwing any object, including perhaps something like a rubber ducky at the window, but her having thrown a specific kind of object or particular type of object like a rock. And it's also not her throwing the rock in the very, very specific way that she did, perhaps by making the rock spin in a particular way en route to the window. Okay, so the idea is going to be that uh, with the commensuration or proportionality criterion, we're going to be able to single out the right kind of behavior by the agent Susie that makes Susie responsible for the outcome. So imagine that the epistemic conditions of responsibility are met and she threw the rock while wanting to make the window break, while knowing that it was likely to happen, et cetera, et cetera. So what we want to say is that it's her throwing the rock at the window that makes 
her responsible for the outcome of the window shattering. And uh, Yablo's proportionality account allows us to make the right kinds of fine-grained discriminations among potential causes in order to allow us to do that. So there's different ways in which you can try and do that. Steve's account does it by appeal to a pretty rich ontology of events that are concrete and that are coincident that differ in their essential properties. Uh, so some of them have richer essences than others and others have poorer essences than, than yet others. And again, um, the proportionality of commensuration idea is setting the problem of overdetermination aside, right? So that we can see the right kinds of dependence relations obtaining between, for example, Susie's throwing the rock and the window shattering. So the account, this is a very, very rough sketch, but it will suffice for our purposes here, says that a potential cause C has the right amount of specificity for the effect E, uh, just in case two conditions obtain. So roughly the, the first condition says C was specific enough, and then the second condition will say but something as specific as that was in fact needed. So C is, it strikes the right balance as far as specificity needed for the effect. So uh, a bit more specifically, we can cash out the first condition in this way. It is true that E would still have occurred if C had occurred in the absence of richer alternatives. So, for example, if Susie had been, um, had said hello loudly while chewing gum, so that's the richer alternative. So now we assume that she wasn't chewing gum uh, while she said hello loudly, Billy would still have been upset. Right? So that suggests that we need, so, so that suggests that C was specific enough that we don't need to also appeal to. The, uh, the fact that she was chewing gum while saying hello loudly. And then the second condition is cashed out in this other way, but it is false that E would still have occurred if poorer alternatives had occurred in the absence of C. So, um, for example, if she had just said hello, but not loudly, so that's a poorer alternative that has a poorer essence, it's false that um, Billy would still have been upset. Right? So something more specific than that was needed, she had to be saying hello loudly. Okay, so that's the very rough account of um, how this is supposed to help with singling out the right kind of behavior as a cause. Now, importantly, Steve notes that there are limitations to this method of commensuration because if you keep going down the list of potential causes that are more and more commensurate, so here I have an example with the Susie throwing the rock at the window case. Uh, then you end up with extremely commensurate potential causes that are too commensurate in a way that um, affects the integrity of the causal order more generally. So we should avoid those potential causes. We should not allow them into our ontology and that way we can roll them out as costs. So an example could be, so we start out with C1, which I think Steve would say is the actual cause. Susie threw the rock at the window, but we can imagine something that has a poorer essence than that, but that is more commensurate. Somebody threw a rock at the window. So imagine that Billy was standing nearby 
but Billy didn't throw any rocks, right? So either Susie or Billy threw a rock at the window would be a condition that is more commensurate, assuming that Billy's throwing the rock would have been sufficient to make the window break. And we can keep going like this. We can take C3, an absolutely commensurate potential cause, which would be something like a suitably large and heavy object was propelled at an adequate velocity towards the window in the presence of appropriate gravitational forces. And maybe even more detail than that is needed, but you get the idea. So we, we end up with this um, potential cause that is specifically designed to make the effect happen. So that's what a dedicated cause is, according to Steve. And this is the kind of thing that we should avoid, according to Steve, because we end up with a disconnection between that thing and everything else in the causal order. So we lose the integrity of the causal order, in particular because these kinds of things would only bring about their dedicated effects, because that's what they're particularly commensurate with. I think a related point to that is that C3, as you can probably see, is quite disjunctive in, na in nature, in a way that guarantees that the commensuration is perfect. Um, and that's another thing that we should avoid. And when you look at C2, C2 is like that as well. Somebody, for example, either Susie or Billy, through the rocket window is quite disjunctive in nature. So we should avoid including those events into our ontology, and that way we can safely say C1 is the cause. Right? So that is Steve's suggestion. He does it in terms of how to come up with the right ontology for causal purposes. He suggests for the purposes of causal theorizing, the right ontology is the one that strikes the best balance or the best overall compromise between commensuration on the one hand and the integrity of the causal order on the other. And he thinks or seems to think that the integrity of the causal order is preserved by not letting in events into our ontology that are too dedicated to their effect, or I would add, relatedly, too disjunctive in nature. Okay, so the upshot of all of this is that we probably need to stop at C1. We should not take C2 or C3 to be uh, causes of the effect. And obviously what this allows us to do is to blame Susie for the shattering. Remember that what the standard view of the connection between causation and moral responsibility was saying is that we should be able to identify a behavior by the agent that brought about the outcome when other conditions for responsibility were met. And then we can hold the agent responsible for that outcome by virtue of that, by virtue of the fact that um, the agent is responsible for that antecedent behavior. If we had gone with something like C2, somebody threw a rock at the window, then we wouldn't have been able to identify a behavior by Susie that she was responsible for and that brought about the outcome. So that has the advantage that it allows us to um, retain the standard view of the relation between causation and moral responsibility. Okay, so now on to a potential problem that I see is once you consider omissions and how to extend this account to um, causes that are omissions, a standard um, example of causation by omission is something like a gardener whose job was to water a plant failed to water the plant, and the plant died as a result. So the gardener, we want to say, 
is responsible for the plant's death, partly because of his antecedent behavior of not watering the plant, which is not an action, but an omission of an action, of a type of action. So it's by virtue of the fact that that omission by the gardener um, brought about the death and the fact that other conditions of responsibility were met that the agent is responsible for the plant's death. Here, I don't know if Steve is aware of this, but there's an interesting discussion between Phil Dow and Sarah Bernstein on what the proportionality account that Steve offers says about omissions or how it could be extended to omissions and what kinds of consequences the account would have. So Phil Dow has this paper in analysis, I think it's from 2010 or something like that, and Bernstein has a response somewhere else. Um, turns out that Dow suggested that when you consider these two potential causes, C1 is the gardener's failure, and C2 is something that doesn't appeal to the gardener, something like the plant wasn't watered. Dow argues that picking C2, which is the more proportionate cause, because if anybody had watered the plant, the plant wouldn't have died, helps solve a famous problem that arises for causation by omission, the so-called problem of profligate omissions, um, illustrated by, for example, the fact that the Queen of England also didn't um, water the plant. But if the Queen of England had watered the plant, then the plant also wouldn't have died. So um, it appeared as if any account of causation by omission would be explosive in the sense that if you wanted to say that the gardener is a cause, you would also have to say that the Queen of England and a number of other people are also a cause. And that strikes some as unfortunate. So Dow suggested, well, we can just pick C2, the more proportionate cause, and say C2 is the cause, not C1. And that way we avoid, the same goes for the Queen of England, right? So we avoid the consequence that the Queen of England is a cause. But of course, the problem with that, as Bernstein points out, is that on the flip side, we also can't preserve the judgment that the gardener caused the plant's death. We can't say that the gardener or the queen caused the plant's death. And Bernstein thinks that that would be disastrous for moral responsibility because we want to be able to blame the gardener because he didn't water the plant. By, by virtue of that behavior that he was responsible for. Um, so uh, Bernstein concludes, and I think I would tentatively agree, that we shouldn't go with the more proportionate cause, C2. We should stick with C1, just like in the Susie case before. And then um, that way we can um, explain why the gardener is a cause and is responsible for the plant's death. We could then explain the queen's lack of responsibility in some other way. Although the queen was one of the causes of the plant's death, she's still not to blame in the same way the gardener is because, for example, she had no duty to water the plant and the gardener did. Okay, so, so far so good. I think all of this suggests that we shouldn't go down the list of more commensurate causes and embrace something like C2 over C1. Still, I think there's a potential problem that remains. Um, the problem is simply that by allowing omissions into our ontology so that we can then hold agents morally responsible by virtue of their omissions, we are allowing a particular kind of behavior that is quite disjunctive in nature because omissions, any omission, is really quite disjunctive in nature. So basically, the gardener omits to water the plant just in case, and they can, you can imagine a range of things that the gardener could have done 
to the extent that he's not watering the plant, right? So any other thing that he could have done instead of watering the plant. And the gardener's omission is in fact equivalent to the strengthening of any such different things that he could have been doing instead of watering the plant. This is also, I think, uh, the result of omissions being quite dedicated to their effects using Steve's terminology. Because um, what turns out is that the gardener's behavior is in fact relevant to what happens to the, to the plant. To the extent that he does anything but watering the plant, right? So it's quite dedicated to the effect of the plant's death in that sense. If so, it seems that there is at least some potential tension with the restriction on commensuration that we talked about before, whereby it seemed that we wanted to be able to roll out causes or potential causes that are uh, dedicated to their effects or to disjunctive in nature. So more on this later. Now I'm going to move on to feature two of Steve's account. This is the second feature that um, I think shows that Steve's account is particularly well suited to ground the moral responsibility of agents. And this is um, based on the de facto dependence account of causation, where again, he is considering the problem raised by overdetermination, and he's trying to tell us a way of distinguishing between scenarios of that kind where there is causation and scenarios of that kind where there isn't any causation. So these are scenarios of overdetermination, all of these. Um, so as I said before, as I anticipated before, one key difference is between scenarios of preemption and scenarios of switching. I'm just using the terminology that people use uh, here normally. So a scenario of preemption would be um, another Susie case where she throws rock at the window, but Billy also throws his rock at the window at the same time, let's assume, but Susie's rock gets there first and breaks the window before Billy's rock can do any harm. So assuming that they both met the relevant epistemic conditions for responsibility, they were uh, responsible for their antecedent behaviors, and they wanted to make the window shatter, and so on and so forth, um, there's still a difference between Susie and Billy, right? It seems that we want to say Susie, not Billy, is responsible for the shattering in this case. And um, part of what grounds that responsibility claim is the claim about causation. So Susie, not Billy, is a cause. Now, in contrast with that, we can think about switching cases. So here's one switching case taken from one of Steve's works. Imagine that there's this runaway trolley bearing down the tracks, and there's a car that is lying up ahead on the track, 110 yards ahead. Now, before the trolley gets there, there's, um, there's um, um, it's, the, the tracks split up into two um, for only 100 yards before they reconverge again for the last 10 yards before the car is situated. So we have a switching mechanism that controls which track the trolley is going to go down on for those 100 yards. Uh, and we can imagine that there is this agent, I'm calling him Flipper, who flips the switch. And when he flips the switch, the train is diverted onto the other track for 100 yards. After traveling on that track for 100 yards, the trolley reaches that reconvergence point that I was talking about before, uh, keeps going on that for 10 yards, and then crashes into the car. Okay, so the only difference that Flipper is making is which track the trolley takes for a while before it crashes into the car. So here again, we can imagine that all the other 
conditions for responsibility are met. So imagine, for example, that Flipper was confused and he thought that the other track was disconnected or that there was something wrong with the other track. And he really wanted to destroy that car with the aid of the trolley. So that's why he flipped the switch. He flipped the switch thinking that that is the only way in which the car would be destroyed. So um, what we would want to say about that case, presumably, is that Flipper is still not responsible for the car's destruction, and the reason is that he's not a cause, that the flipping of the switch is not a cause of the car's destruction, because he was confused, and in fact, the other track was not disconnected. There was nothing wrong with that other track, and as a result, flipping the switch didn't make the relevant kind of difference, because it didn't make um, the, the type of difference that is relevant for causing the outcome. So here we see an interesting contrast between cases that are both over-determination cases. So there's two potential routes to the outcome in both examples. But in the preemption case, we really see Susie as the cause of not Billy. And in the switching case, we see Flipper as not being a cause, which can potentially ground the, um, the claim that uh, he's also not morally responsible for the outcome, although, of course, he's morally responsible for trying to make the outcome happen or something like that. So Steve's account allows us to draw the difference because um, this is the de facto dependence account that, I'm, again, this is a very rough sketch, but I take it this is the main idea. There's no simple counterfactual dependence in any of these cases, right? So the shattering of the window in the preemption case doesn't directly depend on Susie's throw, but it does hold and fix a particular fact about the circumstances, the actual circumstances, the fact that Billy's rock never touched the window. So this is what Steve calls an ennobler, an actual fact such that if we hold it fixed, we restore the dependence, hold and fix the fact that Billy's rock never touched the window. If Susie hadn't thrown her rock, then the window wouldn't have shattered. And moreover, this is the right kind of fact that suggests that there, there is a causal relation. And the way Steve puts it, that fact is the fact that exposes the need for Susie's throw as a real need. And here's my intuitive way of cashing that out. Susie's throw meets a real need for the shattering to happen because, I take it, the idea is um, this is a need that would have to have been met by Billy in the counterfactual scenario, right, where um, it's Billy's um, rock that brings about the shattering because Susie doesn't throw, right? So by throwing her rock, she's meeting an actual real need for the shattering to happen. So, the suggestion is something like we have to compare the actual needs that the sharing has in order to happen with the counterfactual needs in that counterfactual scenario where Susie doesn't throw. So that's what he calls the fallback scenario. And to the extent that we can associate um, the, the need that Susie is meeting with a need that is being met in some other way in that counterfactual scenario, then that means that Susie is meeting a real need, right? So that's what explains, that's the full account of what explains why preemptors are causes, why Susie is a cause. Now, why aren't switches uh, causes? So the first part is the same, so we don't have simple counterfactual dependence. And there is a fact such that if we were to hold it fixed, the dependence would be restored. That is the fact that the trolley never traveled on the other track. 
So Cole didn't fix the fact that the trolley never traveled on the other track. Um, it is true that if Flipper hadn't flipped the switch, then the car wouldn't have been destroyed because it means that there, was, there wouldn't have been any way for the trolley to reach the car, to destroy it. Now, the problem, Steve suggests, is that this is not a real need. This fact is not exposing uh, the fact that um, the, the, the flipping of the switch meets a real need. It's an artificial need. So this is my intuitive way of cashing that out. Steve suggests that Flipper's act doesn't meet any real need or cancel any real needs because all the same needs remain if he flips the switch or if he doesn't flip the switch. And I take it the intuitive idea is that in any case, we need the 100 yard movements by the train as it's approaching the reconvergence point. Doesn't really matter which track that happens on, we still have those needs. And the switching, the flipping of the switch is outside of all of that. So it's not doing anything to meet any of those needs. The same needs would have existed in that kind of factual scenario where he doesn't flip the switch. So that um, uh, counterfactual dependence fact here, it's not exposing any real needs that, um, that are being met or canceled by the flipping of the switch. Okay. Uh, I hope that's enough to explain the difference the way Steve sees it. Now, note that another thing that follows from the account, as Steve points out, is that if the switching had hastened the outcome, if it had made it happen faster, earlier, then the switching would have been the cause. So imagine that the sidetrack onto which the trolley is diverted when Flipper flips the switch is shorter, <coughs> then uh, the switching does cancel some needs because then we no longer have those 100-yard movements. We have, say, 80-yard movements or something like that. So it would have canceled some needs. And, well, Steve thinks that that's the, the right result and I think it might be the right result. In that case, it might be that we would want to hold Flipper morally responsible for the car's destruction because we more basically think that Flipper did something that causally contributed to the car's destruction. Okay, so on to the potential problems. The first problem that I see is once one considers cases that involve two more responsible agents who act wrongly at the same time. And the basic idea is the slogan, it's captured by the slogan that two wrongs don't make a right. So now we add another agent that I'm calling Reconnector. This is from a paper of mine from some years ago on disjunctive causes. Um, imagine now that um, everything's the same except that um, there's this second agent, Reconnector, that had, so that the track had been disconnected and he had reconnected the other track earlier on, also wanting the car to be destroyed. So both agents think they're doing what's necessary for the um, for the car to be destroyed, and they do it wanting for the car to be destroyed, so they meet the other conditions for, morally, for more responsibility. Um, so the track used to be disconnected, reconnected, reconnector had reconnected the other track earlier on, and now Flipper um, is not aware that reconnector had reconnected the track, so he flips the switch, thinking that that's the only way in which the car will be destroyed. So it seems to me clear that we want to hold somebody responsible for the car's destruction. Because here we have two agents who 
acted wrongly, wanting for the car to be destroyed. They had reason to believe that they shouldn't have been doing what they were doing. Um, so we want to hold somebody responsible. It might not be clear who, if both or, or one of them, but we want to hold somebody responsible for the car's destruction. If they hadn't done what they knew was wrong, then the car wouldn't have been destroyed because the, the trolley would have kept going on the main track that was disconnected and maybe it would have derailed, but it wouldn't have reached the car and it wouldn't have destroyed the car. Now, the problem that I see is that it's not clear then how we can hold somebody responsible given uh, everything else that we have said about this account of causation. So first of all, it seems to me we can't hold Flipper uh, causally responsible because his causal contribution is the same as in the original case without reconnector. Um, I don't think that uh, the fact that the track was disconnected earlier on makes any difference to his causal powers at the time, right? In fact, the other track is now reconnected. So the case is exactly the same as the original case. So Flipper cannot be a cause if he wasn't a cause in the original case. Can reconnector be a cause? Well, it seems to me clear that he can't be a cause because the trolley never traveled on that other track, given that Flipper flipped the switch. Right, so uh, what he did made no difference in the relevant sense if the trolley never traveled on that path. So the only thing it seems we can say is that there's a disjunctive cause. So in, in any case, this is what I argued for in that paper of mine. Something like a disjunctive event involving both flipper and reconnector. The fact that either flip, flipper flipped the switch or reconnector reconnected the, the other track. Why that? Well, the rationale is simple, right? If Flipper hadn't flipped the switch, and then the train would have continued on the main track, and if reconnector hadn't reconnected the other track, then the trolley would have derailed, and the car wouldn't have been destroyed. So that means that there's kind of factual dependence between the disjunctive fact involving flipper and reconnector and the car's destruction. So if we can allow uh, disjunctive events of some kind into our causal ontology, then that would come out as a cause and we could, I think, uh, restore the agent's moral responsibility, one or the other. But, um, of course, the, the problem is that um, Steve's proposal from before, the restriction on the commensuration idea, doesn't allow us to include events of this kind that are too dedicated to their effects or too disjunctive. So that's a problem that I see, that uh, if that's the case, then we can't hold anybody morally responsible on any grounds of causation. The second problem, I hope I'm not going on too long. I forget at what time we started in the end. Yeah. How long have I spoken have for, three, roughly? You have, uh, you have talked for 42 minutes. You I'm at 42 three. minutes? Yes. Yeah. OK, I'll try to be fast. So this is the last page. Um, the second problem involves omissions again. Um, so this is a case of omission uh, that I call sharks. Everybody calls it sharks in the literature of moral responsibility, where there's this agent lazy who sees a child drowning in the water, but it's too lazy to attempt a rescue. But there were some sharks swimming in the water, and they would have killed him and prevented the rescue. Imagine that, again, lazy just did it because he was lazy, so intuitively the other conditions for responsibility are met. But he doesn't seem more responsible for the child's death, right? And the reason is that he doesn't seem to be a cause. The problem that I see with um, 
saying this account on based on Steve's account is that the account seems to entail that lazy is a cause. The first part is just the fact that holding fact calling fixed the fact that the sharks didn't attack anybody. The dependence is restored as before. The death does counterfactually depend on Lacey's omission, holding fixed the fact that the sharks never acted. And moreover, the failure to jump in to attempt the rescue does seem to cancel a need in that case for the child's death. Because now the sharks have to attack him to counteract that threat to the death. Right? So the failure to jump in seems to be canceling the need so the account entails that lazy is a cause, it seems to me. And given that the other conditions for responsibility are met, it would follow that lazy is responsible. Um, maybe I'll skip this part so that we can just have more time for discussion. Let me get to the conclusions. So what to conclude from this, I think uh, what I would like to conclude from this is that, um, on the one hand, some of these cases show that, like the flipper and reconnector case, shows that we can be responsible for things without being individual causes of those outcomes. So neither flipper nor reconnector is an individual cause, but together they are, so to speak. Um, and the best way to capture that is in terms of disjunctive causes, as I said before. That means we have to readjust the standard view of the relation between responsibility and causation. We have to ground the agent's responsibility in those cases in their responsibility for a disjunctive cause. I think that's what we have to do. But the problem is that that enters in conflict or there's a potential tension with Diablo's restriction on commensuration. So uh, in other words, I think, although I think um, Steve is right that some disjunctive commensurate causes are not real causes, others really are. And we want to be able to say that they are, as in the case of flipper and reconnector, and it's not clear how we can do that. So this is my diagnosis, just to conclude, and how uh, one could potentially fix this problem, but this would entail revising the account in important ways. I think um, the source of the problem is that the account is exclusively based on dependence relations. Even if it's more sophisticated de facto dependence relations, there are still counterfactual dependence relations. And this discounts the importance of processes or processes of the right kind for causation. And uh, so what I mean by that is actual or counterfactual processes. In the normal case where we have Susie throwing a rock at the window, right, and we didn't want to say it was the fact that somebody threw the rock, either Susie or Billy, that brought it about, but just Susie throwing the rock, it seems to me that the, the underlying reason why we want to be able to say that is that there is an actual process linking Susie with the shattering. In the omission cases, these are counterfactual processes, right? The gardener or the queen are causes uh, because of the fact that in the counterfactual scenario where they water the plant, there's a process linking them to the plant surviving. In the flipper and reconnector case, though, there isn't any such thing. There isn't a process that can be traced back to exclusively just flipper or reconnector. If anything, what we're considering is some counterfactual scenario where they both act, act differently, and as a result, the car is not destroyed but it cannot be traced back to one or the other, but to a more collective type of contribution. And that is why I think we need to be able to make room for these disjunctive costs. So um, a potential fix for these problems would be to allow for a combination perhaps 
of a dependence type of account, such as the de facto dependence account, and some um, um, potential relevance assigned to processes that are either actual or counterfactual in nature. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll stop sharing.